Good evening, friends. Welcome to another Sunday evening devotional from here at Salem Creek Church of Christ. I hope you have had a great day, and I hope you've been able to take advantage of the opportunity to worship God. Thank you for tuning in for this devotional time. We're going to be continuing our study of the life of Abraham, but that's really not what this is all about. We're trying to pick up on the theme of the Bible, what it's all about, so that we can understand it in a better way. It just so happens happens that at this point in doing that, we're looking at the life of the patriarch Abraham. Let me say before we get into that, that we're offering this to you free of charge. It is our devotional guide for this year. This is the uh, third quarter that I'm holding in my hand. Our devotional guide this year is called Exploring the Book. We'd love for you to have a copy of that. If you would like to have that, give us a call here at the building. Our phone number is area code 615-893-7532. In just a couple of weeks, we will be uh, presenting the fourth quarter for this year. We're currently in the process of editing that, and we've already finished writing that. And we'll be making that available to you as well. If you have your Bible with me, I'd like you to open to the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis this evening. We'll start reading in verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men. They arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived in Beersheba. When you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, you find that Abraham is living in pursuit of the promises of God. The call of Abraham to, of God to Abraham comes in the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12. And at that point, he left his father's home at Ur of the Chaldees and he followed God for the rest of his life. He, he lived that life as a nomad but he was living in pursuit of the promises of God. And those promises are repeated several times throughout the life of Abraham, as we have already noted in our Sunday evening devotionals. And so if uh, you want to understand what the Bible is all about, I'd like to encourage you to pick up on that theme, the promises of God. And the promises of God to Abraham are repeated throughout Scripture to other people. They're repeated to Isaac. They're repeated to Jacob. They are fulfilled in Israel, but they are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ through the gospel. It is through him that all the families of the earth are truly blessed. And the reality is that affects us because today those of us who have received salvation through Jesus Christ are the heirs of the promises that God made to Abraham. Well, here in Genesis chapter 22, something very difficult has occurred in the life of Abraham. In the beginning of that chapter, as we saw in the last couple of weeks, God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and I want you to go with me to the land of Moriah and on one of the mountains, which I will show you right there, I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me, a burnt offering. It is impossible for us to comprehend what God was asking of Abraham or what must have been going through Abraham's heart because we've never been put in a situation like that. God has never come to me and said, I want you to take your son and offer him as a burnt offering to me. To compound that, Abraham realizes that Isaac is the child of promise. It is through him that all of these promises are going to come to pass through him and through his descendants. How can it be then that God is asking me to offer him as a sacrifice? Would that not nullify the promises of God or make it impossible for them to come to pass? Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a remarkable insight into the faith and the vision of Abraham, where there the writer tells us that he did it by faith, and he did it by faith 
reckoning that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which also he received him as a figure. Well, he took Isaac to that mountain. He did so with remarkable faith and trust. He told the young men who accompanied them, you wait here, the lad and I will go yonder to worship. We will return to you. Along the way, Isaac asked him, Dad, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And in faith and trust, Abraham said to Isaac, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb. And God did that very thing. He stopped Abraham before he could literally offer his son as a sacrifice. He stopped him. He said, now I know you believe me. I know you trust in me. Don't harm that young man. Abraham looked around. He saw a ram that was caught in a thicket. He took that animal, offered that animal as a sacrifice to God, and so his words were fulfilled. God will provide a sacrifice for himself. There's a wonderful lesson there, as we saw last week. If, if we'll just put our faith and trust in God, God will provide. He will provide for us. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, Paul wrote, We know that all things work together for good to those that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. He has assured us repeatedly, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And the conclusion we draw from that is, therefore, we will not fear what people will do for us. But getting back to the text we've read from Genesis chapter 22. Read from that point forward to the point of the death of Abraham in Genesis chapter 25. And I believe you will find that this is the last time that God ever speaks directly to Abraham. The story of Abraham begins in Genesis chapter 12 with God calling him to leave home, to follow him, and in the process, making promises to him. The narrative of the life of Abraham, so far as his conversations with God are concerned, comes to a conclusion here at the end of Genesis chapter 22. Not by saying Abraham lived happily ever after, but by repeating the promises that had been made not only in Genesis chapter 12, but all along the way as he is journeying by faith. And so verses 15 through 19 of Genesis 22 record what seemed to be God's last words to Abraham. As you read through that text, what you find is that it is a combination of the promises that God has made to him along the way. For example, in Genesis chapter 22, in verse 17, he said, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed will possess the gates of their enemies. Notice the first part of that statement, I'll greatly bless you, I will multiply your seed. Think about what he said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, when he said, I will make a great nation of you, and I will bless you. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17, he said, I'm going to greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand on the seashore. And go back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5, where he made that very promise, look up into the heavens, count the stars. That's how numerous your descendants are going to be. In verse 18 of Genesis chapter 22, he said, In your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Therein is a repetition of what he has said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 when he said, I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So when you read this statement, the last words of God to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 verses 15 through 19 what you find there is a, is a repetition of the promises, really a combination of all of these promises that are made along the way. And, and if you want to, you can view it in this way. Think about Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, Genesis 22 verses 15 through 19. Those form the bookends 
the narrative of life of Abraham in the Bible. That narrative of his life is contained between those two statements of the promises. Now, of course, he's not going to die until Genesis chapter 25. Before he dies, he is going to send servants to find a wife for Isaac. The life of Abraham can be summed up this way. He is living his life by faith in pursuit of the fulfillment of the promises of God. When you think about the life of Abraham, it would be interesting and I think helpful to ask this question. What is it that describes his life or how would you describe his life? I believe the Bible describes it in this way. I believe in the first place it is described with the concept of reverence for Almighty God. Go back to verse 12 of chapter 22 as he has taken that knife, as he is about to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. In verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Now notice verse 12. Do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Is Abraham's life not very fittingly described with that concept, reverence for Almighty God? The angel of the Lord said, on behalf of God, I know that you fear the Lord. When we think about fear, we usually think about being afraid of something in the sense of being scared of something. In the Bible, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the words for fear, the Hebrew words for fear, the Greek words for fear can have reference to being scared of something. But most of the time, it refers to reverence, to godly piety for the highest degree of respect for something. We see it there in the life of Abraham, his respect for God, his reverence for God. So great it was that he would do whatever it was that God asked him to do. You find another example of that in the life of Jesus our Lord. In Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible is telling us about a time in which he offered up strong crying and tears to God, his request that he, he would be spared from death. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning on about verse 8, that he was heard in that he feared. Some translations say he was heard because of his piety, his deep respect for God that would preface every request with these words, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How would you describe the life of Abraham? Does not the concept of reverence describe that life perfectly? I wish that I could have that same type of reverence and respect for God that Abraham had. If you want to describe his life, it's described with that concept of reverence. Not only is it described and defined by that concept, it's also described and defined with the word faith. Again, I want to turn to the New Testament, to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, where the Bible says, by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. How could he do a thing like that? He could only do that through faith in God. I'm afraid that so many times when my faith is put to the test, I want to run and hide. I want to avoid what it is that God is calling me to do. I want to cry out to God, God, if you really love me, you wouldn't be laying this burden on me rather than moving forward and bearing that burden with a great sense of faith and trust in God. I need to have the faith of Abraham, but that defines his life. And he's mentioned several times there in the 11th chapter of the book of, uh, of Hebrews. He left home by faith. He offered Isaac by faith. He lived as a nomad by faith in God. Well, not only is his life defined by the concept of reverence, by the concept of faith, it is also defined by the concept of obedience. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, Abraham was told, 
in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It's interesting, isn't it? Genesis chapter 12, as God makes that call to him, as Abraham starts that journey, God says, and you all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. At the end of that journey, God says to him, and you all the families of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham's life is described with the words reverence, with the word faith, and with the word obedience. I think it is extremely unfortunate and tragic that a lot of people who really profess to love the Lord almost choke over the word obedience. They don't like the word obedience and they dislike it so strongly that it is very difficult for them to say that word obedience and speak of any obligation that we have to obey God. We want to understand that we're saved by the grace of God. We live through the grace of God. It is by His grace that we live and move and have our being, that we draw every breath that we take, that we have salvation through Jesus Christ, that we have our sins covered with His blood, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. But God's people are called to walk in committed obedience. And the Bible even says of Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. The grace of God does not nullify in any sense of the word his requirement that we walk in obedience. And if you look at the life of Abraham, as you see him trusting God, as you see him walking in reverence before God, as you see him living by faith, we always know that he's doing those things because he's walking in obedience to the call of God. Can my life be described in the same way? Now we'll come to Genesis chapter 23, and we find another way in which the life of Abraham has described. Let's go to Genesis chapter 23, and let's read beginning in verse 3. After Sarah, the wife of Abraham, has died, he's got to find a place to bury her. And so the Bible tells us that after he's gone into her and he's mourned over her, verse 3, beginning, Abraham rose from before his dead. He spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Notice how Abraham referred to himself there in that text. He said, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. Go back with me, if you will, to the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis and We'll read a very similar statement about Abraham, that he was, a, he was a sojourner, he was a stranger. In verse 8, God says to him, I'll give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. He talked about the land of their sojournings. In Leviticus chapter 25, he is going to talk in very much the same terms in regard to the nation of Israel in verse 23, God says to them, The land, moreover, shall not be permanently sold, for the land is mine, and you are but aliens and strangers with me. Abraham lived as an alien. He lived as a stranger, even to the ones who were supposedly to possess that land. God says, don't sell that land permanently. That, that, that land belongs to me. You are but a stranger here. You are but a sojourner here. You're living in this land as if it, you are an alien. And in the book of Hebrews, in the 11th chapter, in verse 13, the Bible tells us all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The patriarchs never possessed that land. Abraham never possessed that land. Yes, he bought a piece of land. He owned a deed to a piece of land where he buried his wife. And basically, they were pilgrims, strangers living in that land. 
Throughout the Old Testament, you find that theme. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 34, the Bible says, you showed sympathy to the prisoners. You accepted joyfully the seizure of, seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one, a heavenly one. In other words, this world is not our home. We are looking for a heavenly home. In the book of Psalms, the Bible again picks up on that theme. Psalm, 90, uh, Psalm 39 and verse 12, the psalmist cried out to the Lord, hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. What a description of the life of Abraham. That's how he identified himself as in Genesis chapter 23. He said to the sons of Heth, I am a stranger, I am a sojourner among you. But later on the Israelites were reminded that that described their life as well. And so they weren't to sell the land forever belonged to God, didn't belong to them. They were sojourners, they were strangers in that land. Well, you know what? Like Abraham, like the Israelites, like the psalmist, and like the people that Paul addressed or whoever wrote the book, book of Hebrews addressed in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 34, we are strangers and exiles as we live in this world. We're looking for a better home. We're looking for a heavenly home. We're only passing through this world for a little time. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have deeds to property that we own and consider that for a while we own it. But it's a very powerful way of telling us we never need to consider this world our home. This world is not our home. This world is really foreign to the things that God values. Our home is in heaven. We're only passing through this world, through this life for a little while. And it is when in those times when we allow our hearts to be tied to the things of this life and to the things of this world that we find ourselves drifting away from God. If we will consider God as our Father, if we will cling tenaciously to Him, to His Spirit, to His Son, Jesus Christ, and always keep our eye on the future, looking to that heavenly city, our heavenly home, our heavenly treasure. Then we'll stay strong in our faith, we'll stay close to God, we'll be able to walk with Him through all of the trials of life. I'm reminded of some things Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter six. He said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. And then he says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Abraham at the end of his life when it came time to bury his beloved wife, Sarah, said to those people from whom he would buy a small parcel of land, I am but a stranger and a sojourner as I live in this world. Friends, we're pilgrims, we're strangers, we're sojourners just passing through this alien land on our way to a better and eternal and a heavenly possession where we will be with God forever. Well, that brings us to the close of our time tonight. I hope this has been of some benefit to you the best thing we can do to successfully navigate the trials of this life is to remember our real home is yet to come. Bow with me as we close with prayer. Father, we are so thankful for the very powerful lessons that we see in the life of Abraham, a man who served you so tenaciously, who walked by faith, who walked in reverence for you, who walked in obedience for you, and who realized that going through this land, he was only a stranger, a sojourner, a pilgrim. May that become a very important theme as we live for you in this life, to recognize that no matter how many things in this life we enjoy, and no matter how many things in this life trouble us, this world is not our home. 
We're longing for a better home, an eternal home in heaven above with you. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, thank you very much for tuning in this evening. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, may God bless you all.